Since I did the worst Beatles song list, a few people have asked me if I'm going to do a best Beatles song list. And while I was planning on doing that, I couldn't really figure out the best way to approach it. Everybody has a best Beatles song list, and nobody's list is the same. Like if you were to talk about the best Cream songs, most people are generally going to include Sunshine of Your Love, White Room, and Crossroads somewhere in their top tier of songs. But with the Beatles, it could be anything. You could just be a fan of their early work or the psychedelic period. You can even argue that all their best material can be found on one album. And if it was Abbey Road or Revolver, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. The other problem is that having been in Beatles tribute shows playing both George Harrison and John Lennon, I've dissected these songs so intensely and played these songs so many times, I just find it really difficult to approach it from an objective standpoint. I don't really want to go off on what their biggest chart toppers are, nor do I want my list to be just a bunch of deep cuts. And even then, I really don't know how to rank these songs. I mean, how do you compare Please Please Me to Eleanor Rigby? I mean, th those songs don't even sound like they come from the same band. But I thought, instead of just listing my favorite songs in just a ranked list, why don't I compile them into a compilation of their best material? I used to do that all the time when I was making playlists for my iPod, which I still use when I go running because I'm a weirdo. And the Beatles was definitely a tough one to choose for. So here's what I'm going to do, and I might do this for a few other bands as well. I'm going to compile a playlist, which I will link in the description below. And the way I'm gonna approach it is, if Capitol Records hired me to make a compilation of the Beatles' best stuff and allowed me to personalize it and put it in chronological order, I am the history of rock guy, I like seeing the evolution of bands. And to make this even more challenging, I'm going to format it like it's a vinyl record, which means each side gets about 25 minutes worth of material. For this particular playlist, no longer than 26 minutes a side. These are generally songs I would include in a top 10 list, and since we're not actually compiling a vinyl record, I'll include some bonus tracks as well. With all that said, here is my Beatles playlist. So we're going to start with their first album, Please Please Me. Most fans would probably include Twist and Shout or I Saw Her Standing There. While these are classics and might have gone on my list at one point, I've just played them too many times. I saw her standing there especially, and even then I think they're a bit overplayed to begin with. Instead, I'm going to go with their first number one in England, the title track, Please Please Me. Influenced by Roy Orbison, Please Please Me features some uniquely arranged vocals, John Lennon's neat harmonica line, which was kind of their signature sound at the time, and some pretty progressive instrumental hits for 1963, especially coming from a pop rock band. You can tell right away that Ringo's unconventional style of drumming is going to shape their sound, and that John Lennon and Paul McCartney are going to be a songwriting duo to contend with. I still love playing the song, I still love listening to the song, though I do recommend listening to the single version, unless you want to hear them screw up the third verse, which admittedly is still pretty fun to listen to. There's a lot of singles to choose from this time, and for historical reasons, you might want to go with I Want to Hold Your Hand, their first number one in America, but I personally prefer their second number one in America, and that's She Loves You. Admittedly, it's very poppy, but in all the right ways. Sometimes you have to remember what was going on at the time to really appreciate this song. It's an exciting track, the lyrics sound very conversational, that three-part six harmony is so iconic, and credit George Harrison for the lead guitar lines that just glue everything together. It's the last song they play on stage in A Hard Day's Night, so it's definitely got that going for it. And speaking of which, to be honest, I probably wouldn't include a lot of their early material on a top 10 list, but this is one exception. The title track to their first film is so well crafted, and John Lennon wrote this in a day to give the film a title song. You got John singing the unforgettable melody, Paul sings the soulful bridge, George plays that archetype 12 string solo, and there's Ringo holding it all together with a strong backbeat. Hell, Ringo came up with the title, one of his play on words. Lyrically, you can see them moving in a slightly different direction than just Love Me Do or P.S. I Love You. It's a song where you hear that signature 12-string opening, and you immediately know what it is. Let's move on to Day Tripper from 1965, and obviously one of their early drug references, though it's also been cited as being about a prostitute. We were just trying to write songs about prostitutes and lesbians, that's it. <laughs> Every guitar player learns this infectious lick. And the unforgettable three-part harmony chorus just soars like a flaming peacock on an acid trip. Not that I've been on an acid trip before. 
let's move on. You can't not include a song from Rubber Soul, a very important album in their development as a band. And for me, it's no question that Nowhere Man is the best tune on the album. This may very well be John, Paul, and George's finest moment harmonizing with each other, which they do throughout the entire song, with John taking a lead on the bridge. And by now, John has evolved so much as a lyricist, stepping away from the marketable teenage romance subject. Hell, the song came to him while he was just laying down in his room, probably contemplating about his own state of mind. You can hear the desperation of feeling isolated and aimless, wanting to be something greater. And all of this is conveyed in the second person. It's like he's asking us to look at our own complacency, which is genius, really. On top of that, George's lead guitar lines, played on his new Fender Strat, just sparkle, paving a hopeful path for the melancholic lyrics. To captivate all this in under three minutes is an achievement, to say the least. Speaking of George Harrison, his opening track on Revolver is a real rocker about... paying taxes. I know, timely, right? George was not happy when he realized that most of his Beatle money was being absorbed by taxes, being used to fund military weapons. But rather than the song being overtly angry or political, George approached the lyrics with ton-in-cheek humor, with a little help from John. I think what I love most about this tune is just how unique the melody and harmonies are. You can really start to hear George's Indian influence, a lot of fourths and fifths in the harmonies. Though curiously, that's not George playing the Indian-inspired guitar solo, it's Paul. The story goes that George was having trouble tracking the solo, so Paul took over, knocking it out in one take. And it's really one of the Beatles' most memorable solos. Revolver really was the album where George established himself as a songwriting contender, but it was also where Paul really evolved as a songwriter. I've mentioned before in History of Rock that Eleanor Rigby was a turning point in the evolution of the genre. The somber tone of the melody and lyrics is a far cry from I Wanna Hold Your Hand. For a pop song to speak more about the human condition, loneliness, even death, wasn't often heard in rock and roll. Wearing a face that she keeps in the jar by the door. How do you even come up with a lyric like that? While this was credited to Lennon and McCartney, the latter more so, obviously, it was actually a collaboration with all of them. Ringo came up with the idea of Father Mackenzie darning his socks, and George supposedly came up with the look at all the lonely people hook. And George Martin's orchestration cannot be understated. While he and Paul had collaborated like this before on Yesterday, this is the song that really took on an identity of its own. Not to mention what a huge influence this was on bands and artists across all genres. Honestly, you could put a lot of Paul's Revolver songs on this list, and not all of them are so somber. In fact, on Revolver, he came up with one of his best rockers. Got to Get You Into My Life, an amazing track with an R&B flavor. Again, a bit atypical for the band at this time. There's no harmonies, the guitars aren't really prevalent until the memorable break. Instead, we get a cool horn section supporting Paul's rock and vocal, one of his best, really. And that's really the best word to describe the song. Cool. It's just a cool song. That's probably why Earth, Wind and Fire covered it years later for that terrible Sgt. Pepper film, by far the best thing in it. And it sounds like we're back to singing lyrics about love, right? Well, love for marijuana. Yeah, once I found out it was about weed, it made complete sense. I took a ride, I didn't know what I would find there. Maybe that's why John considered it one of the best Beatles songs. And I agree with him. But after the release of Revolver and the Beatles' retirement from touring, John ended up writing one of the best songs of all time. And I, and I don't just mean one of my favorite Beatles songs. I mean literally one of my favorite songs ever written. Strawberry Fields Forever. At this point, the Beatles were no longer bound by the live guitar-based drums configuration and could essentially do whatever they wanted. Strawberry Fields starts off with a Mellotron, is textured by backwards recorded cymbals and George's Indian instruments, and a lush orchestral arrangement courtesy of George Martin. These arrangements are so avant-garde. The low drone of the cellos, the brass stabs, it really makes you feel like you've stepped into this Alice in Wonderland kind of world. Or maybe another acid trip, whichever comes first. And yes, this song definitely has its influence in LSD, the ego death thing, nothing is real, living is easy with eyes closed. However, the actual title came from a Salvation Army home from John's childhood. And then some of these lyrics are 
just random. I think a no may mean a yes, but it's all wrong. These kind of ton twisters would really become a staple of John's writing. You know, I Am the Walrus being a great example, and they're just great. I have to stop writing those daft words, man. I don't know what I'm saying. Even as an acoustic demo, Strawberry Fields works beautifully with its innovative lyrics and melody. But the whole way it's arranged here, the way the arrangements just build on top of one another, the dynamics, there's just no other song like Strawberry Fields. The way it fades back in, I, I just think it's the perfect way to end the first side of this compilation. So what's gonna start off side two? Well, how about the opening to Sgt. Pepper? Yes, this one's a classic. From the opening orchestral atmosphere before the heavy acid rock beat comes in with Paul playing the lead guitar part. He dives into a heavy rock and roll vocal, singing mostly the same note for the first four lines. Then you got three-part harmonies, some horn arrangements from George Martin. It's just a great way to kick off this timeless record. And of course, this leads us seamlessly into the next tune, Son of Course by Ringo. And if you grew up the same time I did, you know this is the Wonder Years song, sung of course by Joe Cocker. Now I have to confess, I wasn't initially going to include either of these two songs. I don't necessarily consider them favorites, friends especially, but I just think it would be wrong to compile a Beatles compilation and not include at least one Ringo song. And let's face it, this really is his signature tune. It's a fun sing-along, I love the call and response moments between Ringo and John and Paul, and you gotta love the line, what do you see when you turn out the light? I can't tell you, but I know it's mine. When I was a kid, I didn't know what that meant, but when I found out as an adult, I laughed my ass off. And of course, Paul insisted Ringo sing that high E for the climax, which is a perfect ending. Okay, we're moving on to the White Album, and there's a couple songs on here that are some of my absolute favorite Beatles songs. The first is Dear Prudence. This might very well be John's most gorgeous ballad, written during their India retreat about Mia Farrow's sister, Prudence, who had secluded herself in transcendental meditation. But beyond that, it's just such an emotionally moving song with an uplifting message to come out and enjoy the beauty of the world. His finger-picking riff is one of my favorites he came up with, and a lot of fun to play. Paul's bass line anchors the riff, and George's lead lines are a perfect counterpoint to it. Curiously enough, that's Paul playing drums. Ringo had walked out of the session, and I keep going back and forth with this. I'm not a huge fan of Paul's drumming, but it does make for some wonderfully quirky fills, especially on that break. And of course, I have to include While My Guitar Gently Weeps. I mean, it's what the press always highlighted in the Let It Be show, commenting on, uh... What a brilliant guitarist I am. I think everyone knows that's Eric Clapton playing the famous solo, long considered one of the greatest in rock history, and for good reason. The story goes that John and Paul weren't really taking this new tune of George's very seriously, so when he brought Eric in, the mood lightened up immediately. Paul played that iconic piano opening and the song was rocking right away. This really was Eric Clapton at the top of his guitar playing game. He was still working with Cream, and he really brought the intensity to a song that needed a guitar gently weeping. Without the guitar solo, it's still a brilliantly crafted tune on George's part, drawing influence from the I Ching, with every mistake we must surely be learning, that line really hits home, but it's really Eric's interplay with George's vocal that make it one of my all-time favorites. Now, Revolution 1 appeared on the White Album, and it's actually one of my biggest disappointments. Not that it's bad, far from it, I like the acoustic blues interpretation, but the heavy version of the single that was released? That might be my all-time favorite Beatles song. Seriously, if I had to make a list of the top 10 Beatles songs, I think Revolution would be number one. For one thing, it's just such a rocker. The screaming acid guitars recorded directly into the console, Ringo's heavy drums. I mean, I know people cite Helter Skelter as their heaviest track, a contender for the first heavy metal song, and I love that one too. But what separates Revolution from it are John's lyrics. Political protest songs, specifically about Vietnam, were just starting to become commonplace. And when the Beatles sang about it, the world listened. The subject is more along the lines of, what are we fighting for? John saying, well, I'm into the idea of revolution, but not if it's gonna mean violence. Even if he does technically contradict himself. Don't you know that you can count me out? 
In this respect, I think this is much more a profound statement than all you need is love or give peace a chance. He's speaking directly to the counterculture in such a flowing narrative of rhyme and rhythm. I guess the only part of the song that dates it is the Chairman Mao reference, but it also makes the song a time capsule as well as being timeless. My actual favorite version of Revolution is the video version, which sadly isn't available in audio form. I just love that they utilized the backup vocals from the acoustic version, the shooby doo was. I always insisted on including these in our live performance. I love Paul screaming back and forth with John. Also, credit Nicky Hopkins for that neat piano solo in the middle. It's a heavy tune, it's an inspired message, and it's still one that I love playing. And now we come to Abbey Road, my favorite Beatles album. So I've had quite a journey with arguably the most famous song from this album, certainly the most played song in the internet age, and that is Here Comes the Sun. Yeah, take that, Lennon McCartney, Harrison got the last laugh. When I was a kid, my parents had a cassette tape of Beatles songs they'd play on the way to school, and it would always start with Here Comes the Sun, every morning. It's one of the first songs I played in front of an audience as a guitar player. As time went on, I kinda got a little tired of it, especially when playing it a lot in Let It Be, but at some point it just kinda became a favorite of mine again. It's like this perfect three minutes of pop music without it sounding contrived or corny, and part of what makes it so unique is the Indian influence. The subdivisions of that guitar riff, bars of three and two, are the most obvious example, but also the way George sings. You really do picture in your head him walking in his garden, watching the sun come out after the long winter. He really is becoming this guru in his own right, foreshadowing what's to come on All Things Must Pass and living in the material world. It's like the perfect counterpoint to Revolution, a softer acoustic song about finding positivity in life. And even on Abbey Road, it's the perfect follow-up to the more distorted, heavy sound of I Want You, She's So Heavy, yin and yang. It's just a marvelous composition. And with another classic of his on Abbey Road, Something, it's very clear at this point George had become just as good a writer as the iconic Beatles duo. But my actual favorite piece on Abbey Road is Paul's Concoction, the medley from You Never Give Me Your Money all the way up to the end. It's really hard to separate these songs, and you have to listen to them as one symphonic piece. And musically, it's very somber. It's like the Beatles, Paul especially, knew that the band was breaking up, so they said, you know what, let's go out with a bang. Remember, even if Let It Be came out afterwards, Abbey Road was the last recorded album of the Beatles. But it's really hard to include that on a compilation, so I decided to include the final three songs of the medley. Golden Slumbers, Carry That Weight, and The End. Golden Slumbers features some beautifully subtle orchestration from George Martin, and one of Paul's most moving vocals. Carry That Weight includes a reprise of You Never Give Me Your Money, and The End is the only time you can hear a real drum solo from Ringo, as well as Paul, George, and John, in that order, training guitar solos. A badass track to go out on. The final lyric, in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make, it's perfect. It's just the perfect ending for the Beatles swan song. Even if it is a little undercut by Her Majesty, but, well, at least the Beatles showed they still had a sense of humor. So, that's my compilation. I feel it really shows off the progression of the band and highlights a lot of what I consider to be their best material. But since we are making a playlist here, let's go ahead and add in some bonus tracks. I'm going to limit it to six songs. Going back to Rubber Soul, I'm going to include George's If I Needed Someone, a song that really showed off his early songwriting skills. That guitar line shines, it's got harmonies just as majestic as Nowhere Man. I almost included it on the list, but decided to list Taxman instead. Here, there, and everywhere. I was going back and forth between this and For No One, and honestly, I just felt like more people would want me to list this over For No One, and for good reason. It's a beautifully written song, includes some subtle but effective harmonies, one of Paul's best. I'm gonna include another one from Sgt. Pepper, and this really is one that would be on a top 10 list for me, and I might be alone in that. Within you, without you. No, seriously. Sure, it's a bit long and not as exciting as other tracks, but it's not meant to be. It's an introspective track, obviously heavily influenced by Ravi Shankar and Indian music. The lyrics are one of the first of many to cite Hindu philosophy, the wall of illusion, interpreting the subject of love more as an introspective idea, and it works very well, especially for the time considering the enlightened state of mind the culture was seeking. What really makes this a standout for me is the instrumental break, and obviously we hear George's sitar, but the arrangements are so sublime. 
I love the way the Western orchestration comes in interpreting the Indian melody and the interplay between them. There's just no other Beatles song like this. My only issue is that because of its length, I couldn't include it in the main playlist without losing a tune. That's why I went with the two leadoff tunes instead. But I'm really serious when I say Within You Without You is one of my all-time favorite Beatles songs. We're not out of psychedelia yet because I'm also including I Am The Walrus. It's such a wacky tune, and that's why it's so much fun. What do the lyrics actually mean? I don't know. And I don't think John really knew either. I think he just wrote him to screw with people. Now that's rock and roll. Marvelous orchestration from George Martin, a solid backbeat, classic Beatles track. I know I haven't included a song from Let It Be yet, and I'm sure a lot of people want me to include the title track, which is a beautiful tune, but I think my favorite is I've Got a Feeling. A nice combination of two songs from Paul and John. It's pretty fun to hear them sing at the same time at the very end. Outside of that, it's just a raw rocker. Great guitar riff, some nice licks from George and Billy Preston, and of course you got Paul screaming. How can you not love it? And I think I'd be beside myself if I didn't include Come Together. Hell, my one-man band cover is kind of what got this channel going. Honestly, this is one of those songs that I'm a little tired from playing too many times. Maybe not so much as I saw her standing there or help, but that's not the song's fault. It's just a fun rock and roll tune alluding to Chuck Berry, Muddy Waters, and I guess Yoko, but whatever. And Come Together is a good message to close out the bonus tracks. I'm gonna include a Spotify playlist in the description, but what would be on your Beatles playlist? Comment below and let me know. And let me know also what other artists or bands you'd like me to do if I do a few more of these. I'm thinking about doing the Stones next. You might have seen my poll I did about them. Uh, that's going to be a little bit tougher to cover considering their career was much longer than the Beatles. They're still technically a band. But we'll see how it goes. As always, stay safe, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Hey, I wanted to give a special thank you to everyone who's donated so far to our History of Rock 2000's fundraiser. We've raised over $400 so far, and I really, really appreciate it. If you haven't donated yet, check out the link below. We're already into pre-production, and in fact, you can watch an exclusive video of me, Nick, and Ashley writing the script on my Patreon page. Speaking of which, another shout-out to my Patreon supporters. If you feel like contributing to my Patreon page, you'll get some exclusive material, like I mentioned before, you can watch History of Rock commercial-free, and extended versions of some of my other videos. Take care, all.